review for auditing Professor Sky's record review, where today I won't be reviewing a record. Instead, I will be reviewing the Netflix special by Bo Burnham, Inside. I'm justifying this because I'm actually going to make a pretty bold claim. I'm sorry to say to Chromio and to Charlie XCX and Weezer and OK Kaya, but I believe I have found the definitive album of COVID, the Corona, the quarantine album, and it is the comedy special Inside. If you haven't seen it, it's on Netflix. I would suggest getting Netflix just to watch it. It's that good. It is a little over an hour, I don't know, an hour and a half of a man alone in a room for an entire year making funny songs and doing little skits. And the thing is, what makes this so good, so exemplary of this time that we've lived through, is not what it has, but the way that it accentuates the things that it doesn't. You see, a normal album, a normal musical album, can't really emphasize the lack of public. The relationship that there is on a studio album is just between the musicians and then the person listening at home. The thing that you feel in Inside is the not performance. It's not just that it's not a performance, it's that it is a performance of a not performance for a not public. The lack of the public is part of the show. It is capable of putting you in this world where you are alone with his thoughts, right? That's been the worst part for many people of this whole thing is being stuck alone with your thoughts. Or if you're not alone with your thoughts, you're stuck with other people's thoughts on social media. Or you're stuck with the terrible situation in the world coming into your brain through social media, through technology. The whole thing is about struggling with technology, by technology, for technology, <laughs> on technology. The words struggle and technology, however you want to mix those together, like however you want to mix those together, this special is capable of expressing all of that. And of course, most of all, we have this sense of loneliness, depression, and isolation, which we have all been feeling. Before I, I'll put that away. Before we get much further here, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of genius, okay? <laughs> because that word gets thrown around a lot, okay? I throw it around too much. Um, but let's try to understand what it is that makes Bo Burnham a genius. Now, I, I can say that he is a genius with some confidence. I can also say that doesn't make him the best comedian, okay? But let's just talk about it for a second. Part of what makes this whole thing so impressive, yes, it is written and shot and performed by him. But probably what makes it so good, what makes it so powerful, is that he edited the whole movie himself. So you have this feeling, and he shows a lot of behind the scenes footage of him alone in this single room for an entire year, not just recording all this music and singing it, but also him editing it. Another famous boy genius, Orson Welles, uh, would talk about editing. Uh, I found this interesting interview with him in a Cahier du Cinéma from 1958, where he talks about how he sees editing. Mind you, Orson Welles is one of the most famous auteurs who would write, direct, and star in his own movies. But here he talks about the importance of editing. I'm not going to do an Orson Welles impersonation. But for, my, okay, but for my style, for my vision of cinema, the editing is not one aspect. It is the aspect. Directing is an invention of people like you, meaning film critics. It is not an art or at most an art for a minute a day. That minute is terribly crucial, but it happens only very rarely. The only moment where one can exercise any control over a film is in the editing. When you watch this movie, try to keep in mind what he's showing you. He's showing you these songs and this creativity and all this work, but then he's also putting it all together. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this. If you're a fan of this channel, you know something about me and editing. I don't do it. Maybe one in every 50 of my videos do I edit. I made a decision when I started the channel, I'm just going to go, I'm going to record. If I make a mistake, I'll either start over or I will just leave it in. Editing makes you crazy. COVID makes you crazy. 
having pre-existing psychological problems, including panic attacks, makes you crazy. This album, screw it, I'm just gonna call it an album, this album of a comedy special is dedicated to that feeling of going crazy through editing, through pre-existing mental conditions, and through quarantine. Which, by the way, the words quarantine, corona, coronavirus, Trump, Black Lives Matter, none of them are mentioned ever throughout the entire special. It's capable of being completely of this moment while very carefully avoiding any of those specific markers. Now, when I talk about why he is a genius and why this special shows that, one of the things that I realized is that he has sort of three kinds of funny, okay? So when I watch his stuff, there's the first kind of funny where I just kind of laugh and I just kind of feel like, okay, I, I get it, you know? Henry Bergson, the great uh, French theorist on laughter, talks about how laughter is primarily the work of, of, of intellect, right? That emotion is the enemy of laughter because if you empathize with the person you're laughing at, you no longer laugh. I um, mean, he talks about how it really is an exercise of pure intelligence. And so every time you laugh, no matter at what, you are laughing from a position of intelligence. So that first laugh is like, okay, this is, this is kind of funny. Then Bo Burnham gets me on that second laugh where I identify myself as being very intelligent and educated and very smart. Okay, I don't mean to be arrogant, but I do think of myself as very smart. And, and that's that little bit where I go, uh, Bo, we're in the same little club together. We're the smart person club. You understood something. And listen, you know, I probably couldn't say it as well as you could. I probably could if I tried, but maybe not as well, not as successfully. And, you know, you're younger and handsomer and all that stuff. But uh, still, still, we're on the same level, Bo. Okay, we're, we're in the same place. We know how to do this. Okay, that kind of like arrogant uh, nature of comedy where comedy, as actually uh, Bergson mentions again, uh, does create a sort of in-group and an out-group. That's what laughter does. And he has a higher level of comedy in which you can feel like you're part of that in-group. You get that next level of joke. But what is it that makes Bo Burnham one step funnier than that? Is he says something I hadn't thought of. Something I never could have come up with. An observation that when he makes it, makes me say, bam, crystal clear, absolutely, I'm totally with you. But I never would have thought of it. And when I see something like that, I just say one word, four letters, damn. <laughs> I just say, damn. I laugh, but I say, damn, how did he do it so well? How did he say it so well? And all this is kind of tied into the fact that comedy can do something that a lot of other art forms can't do because it is so clearly based on intellect. It's based on intelligence. But the thing about genius, when I think about genius, when I think about artists I consider to be genius, it's the ability to deliver something intellectually stimulating and emotionally resonant at the same time. That's what gets me to say, damn, you know? Musically, probably the best example is, is Mozart. <laughs> I know that sounds like cliche, but if you've never heard uh, Mozart's clarinet concertos, just damn. I mean, okay, the, the, second, the second movement is famous for being very moving, but the first movement and the third movement are just as moving. I like this so much, I bought it twice, okay? Stereophonic, all right? Like, you listen to this, and you know that his brain is working on this whole other level, but then he's capable of just eliciting these emotions, or the Beach Boys, okay? Brian Wilson at his prime, capable of doing the same thing, of writing these melodies and these harmonies. In a totally different realm, I would say the album Yeezus by Kanye also makes me go damn with its intellect and its construction and its vision. In literature, you know? You know, Shakespeare? I know it seems obvious, Mozart and Shakespeare, but they're obvious for a reason. If you've ever felt jealous in a relationship and you read Othello, Oh my God, just get out of here. The way he describes jealousy, you could spend 10 billion years with the greatest artists of all time, say, make the perfect work about jealousy, and you would not get one-tenth of the way to the success that he had, okay? Or whatever. Proust, another feeling that I get, literary criticism, that's how I feel reading SZ by Roland Barthes. When I'm, <laughs> did I pronounce the S on there? I'm a French professor, Roland Barthes. Uh, <clears throat> Barthes. Uh, in art, it happens, you know, whenever I look at, at the hands, the way Picasso is able to draw hands, there's a sort of intelligence and emotional strength in there. And when I was watching this whole 
this whole special, when I saw How the World Works, one of the songs, which I'll be discussing here, I just said, damn, for the strength and the emotional content. I chose all of these works here, not just to show I'm a smarty smart pants guy, I'm not trying to do that, but every single thing I just showed you, Othello, Proust, Roland Barthes, Jesus, Beach Boys, are things that made me cry. Like, they made me weep. And it's not that they made me weep because they were sad, but I'm just so moved that a human being can create something so beautiful. The same way one might cry at a sunset if it's particularly beautiful, I cry when I listen to that goddamn clarinet concerto. I could put it on right now and I would cry for you right now on screen. I don't care. I'd cry in front of my students. I'd cry in front of my kids. I'd cry in front of strangers. Music that is so beautiful, art that is so beautiful, when it engages so equally with your intellect, this big brain thing that we have as human beings that we have been blessed with and cursed with, and with our emotions. Now I'm sort of moving into a different category when I'm talking about Bo Burnham's special because I'm talking about it as music but also as art. And what I think is interesting is a lot of what makes this album uh, so strong is that most of it is a meditation on whether or not it should exist. What is the role of comedy in such bad times, in such dark times? As he says, what is the point of making jokes? And it is essential to note that this is not about making jokes. This is about making art. This is about making a movie, writing a book, making music, whatever it is, these are the questions. And it's this dual moment that we're living where we're all sad and there's hundreds of thousands of us dying, okay? And our country is on the verge of being overthrown, right, over the last year. Um, and then at the same time, he's very cognizant and very self-aware of being a cis white male, an affluent cis white male, okay? Like yourself, like your, like your dear host here, okay? Not affluent like he is, but there you go. And the, this is what's amazing, is he asks these questions. What can I do? What is the point of what I'm doing? And he not only does not give you an answer, you, my fellow members of uh, the amazingly privileged who have been given so much and asked of so little, he, he, he doesn't give us any answers, but he goes that one step further by giving us all of the answers that we had and destroying them, destroying us for doing the work, destroying us for our pitiful efforts of trying to pretend like we actually are interested in removing ourselves from power, okay? The precision and the clarity with which he attacks us, and by us, I mean affluent, white, cis, straight males, is insane. It is. It is very powerful. No answers, but he takes every answer and destroys it. I am going to be referencing Brian Wilson probably a fair amount here. A lot of this whole thing, the thing that makes me feel closest to this is listening to Brian Wilson's like like sessions, like hearing him in the studio, because you, you had this feeling of somebody who has just so much in their head and they're trying to get it out and you can actually get a little peek behind the curtain and see what it looks like. So I'm gonna break down the whole album, the whole special, and I'm gonna go song by song and skit by skit. Spoilers, if you haven't seen it, don't watch this, okay? You've watched it this far, this is all I want you to watch, okay? Just go watch it. So the first skit is with him entering this clean room from the outside. Okay, he makes kind of a sad face, and then he starts playing music. And when I first started watching this, I remembered the fact that I hate musicals. I hate musicals, I hate people singing, I hate the piano, and the way that he sings, in theory, is something I should hate. But I just don't, because it's good enough. I actually think I don't hate musicals, that'll be for another time. But what this actually reminded me most of is when I was a kid, my parents loved this comedian named Mark Russell who would play songs on the piano that would be about current events, you know, like about the deficit or about Nicaragua, okay? And uh, it was always this funny time because like I felt really like privileged that I got to stay up late and, and watch this comedian with my parents, but I just didn't understand anything. 
So maybe my initial uh, dislike of Bo Burnham, I hadn't liked him until recently, came from the fact that just someone smart playing piano reminded me of not understanding things as a kid. But he starts off the whole album with a song called Getting Up, I'll call it Getting Up, Sitting Down. Talking about the difficulty of making it through your day, like getting up and sitting down, kind of an 80s synthesizer, new wave thing. It actually reminds me a lot of the music of Patricia Taxon, uh, who I've reviewed a lot on here, and also very clearly Weird Al. Weird Al Yankovic is such an, a, a clear influence on everything here. Uh, he talks to him about himself, as saying Robert's been a little depressed. It's fun hearing him use his real name. And then he says, look, I made you some content. And when he says this, everything goes crazy and a disco ball starts going and he was in darkness and now there's light everywhere. And I love this emphasis of the word content. Content is a crucial thing. Content is a crucial word that we need to study about how is it used and what does it mean. I produce a lot of content. I do three videos a week. I also do a podcast about Star Wars toys. I also just content, content, content. What does it mean to be a content creator? Is a content creator an artist? Always or never, I don't know. And has the beautiful line, it's a beautiful day to stand inside. Or to stay inside. Then there's a little skit, nice kind of ballad of a kind of behind the scenes thing. And then we have one of the thesis statements of the album, hearing the world with comedy, what's going on. You hear like the sound of laughter in the background that he's putting on here. See, I'm not gonna edit because now Toby's jumping into the room. Yeah, Toby, you can jump up, but don't jump on the Mozart, buddy. Uh, I'm not gonna edit. Um, and it becomes kind of inspirational because he's asking the question, you know, like, why, what am I doing? And he says, ironically, the world needs direction from a white guy like me. And he's constantly asking, what can he do? And maybe he should just shut up. Maybe he should just stop because if he's like us, if he's one of the people who have been given so much and asked so little, like, what should he do? And he doesn't stop. He just keeps going because he gets bored. And with one of the funniest lines of the entire thing, making a little difference metaphorically. And then he does a thing with all of his songs, I've noticed this going back to his previous specials, where he has the whole song and it's a catchy song and it's stuck in your head. And then, one step deeper, path with another melody, another bit to end, and then that's the bit that gets stuck in your head because he repeats it three or four times at the end. Uh, if you wake up uh, cut, you know, surrounded in smoke, don't panic, call me and I'll tell you a joke and he goes through different iterations of this, and that is the role of all artists, right? I mean, you know, I am a doctor of philosophy, right? I'm a real French professor, and sometimes, it'll, you know, someone will, will have a physical problem. I'll be like, don't worry, I'm a doctor. I can tell you exactly what pages of Roland Barthes you should read. A little uh, monologue after that in front of a mirror, um, talks about distracting him from wanting to kill himself. Suicide is a major theme of this. Um, I don't like the parts that are about suicide because I'm afraid that they're true. The only thing worse than if they're true is if they're not true and he's doing it for a joke. Either way, it makes me uncomfortable. But then we get to the song FaceTiming with my mom, which is a, hilarious, right? That's one of those things where you're like, okay, that's funny, you know, what a funny idea. He makes fun of the fact she doesn't know how to use her phone and she keeps it five, five inches from her face. The whole thing is done as like an R&B song, you know, like a silky, sexy, smooth R&B song, but it's about FaceTiming with your mom. I'm a FaceTime with my mom tonight. Very well done. Very funny details in the conversation, but really, fundamentally what this is, is about just children and their Adult children and their parents having an empty relationship. They don't talk about anything important. He sees that her hair is wet and says, did you take a shower? And she says, how did you know, right? Just a very kind of basic, stupid, banal conversation. The dad comes on, says, hi, how you doing? Doing good. That's the deepest conversation we've ever had. This is one of the real questions, you know? He has to talk to his parents through FaceTime because of COVID and technology is at fault, and COVID is at fault. But really, what's the problem here is a human problem of an inability of adult children and parents to have a meaningful relationship. This is not about COVID. This is not about technology. This is about human failure. And if we can look at this whole special and you just take away all of the stuff about social media and about COVID and about isolation, you'll see it's actually about human problems. And that's what gives you that power. That's why I'm, I'm literally getting 
goosebumps right now thinking about how good this art is. Like, I'm serious, I really am, okay? Like, that's the strength of this album, of this special, of this movie, of this artwork. Can we just call it that? Then we get to the song, That's How the World Works. Starts off as a gentle, fun song, imitating a song for kids, you know, about how the birds and the bees and the oceans and the skies and the trees, everyone gives what they can and gets what they need this nice vision of the way the world works. And then he has the character of Sako, a sock puppet who speaks to him. And this is where the, so the, the whole thing just gets amazing because the, he represents me, right? Us, right? The people in power in society. And he's asking, what, how does the whole world work? Let me tell you children how the world works. And this sock represents a cynical, a cynical truth teller who speaks truth to power. And literally, he is speaking the truth to the person in power, to the person who controls everything, who is pretending to wonder how the world works. That's what's important. Bo Burnham, as the face of white power, and when I say white power, I don't just mean white, I mean of power itself, of, of class power, of race power, of gender power, whatever power systems that exist, he is representing all of those power systems, okay? So if, if this is in Japan, I'm talking about the people in Japan who control everything. I'm not talking about white people in Japan who control everything, okay? It is just a question of power. He is asking, how does the world work? And when the sock responds, it talks about classism, that the world is built with blood, the global network of capital, the FBI killed ML Martin Luther King, about the, the evils of capitalism and the wealth gap. And all of a sudden we have the initial response from power to, uh, to, to the oppressed is, wow, what can I do about it? He doesn't initially try to stop it. And that's what's been happening in this last year. Remember I told you that whole thing about, damn, damn, Bo Burnham's got it. Damn, 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 he's got it. Please put in the comments, damn, not for me, for Bo Burnham. When, when you, how many times did you say damn during this special? Because at first he asks, what can we do about it? To which the sock responds, I don't know, but don't burden with me educating you, okay? And then, he gets mad. What is it with you rich white people where every socio-political issue, you can only see it through the lens of your own self-actualization. Get with it or get out of the way. And when Sako says that, that's the turn. Now me, power, okay, authority, the people in civilization who've been given so much and asked so little, say, hey, watch it. Remember, who's on whose hand? And that's where we get to our current state. Remember who's on whose hand. Power is willing to be challenged up to a point, is willing to be questioned up to a point, is willing to ask questions as though it wants to know the answer. The second that it actually hears the answer that it does not want to hear, it then says, you are my puppet. I control you. Sako resists. He starts to kill Sako by taking him off his hand. He begs to stay on because when he's not on the hand, he's in a liminal state of being. And all of a sudden, this power, who'd been acting friendly, who'd been acting curious, is not at all interested in asking how does the world work. He puts the sock back on. The sock speaks to him and says, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry. You're right. And that's how the world works. Damn, just an impressively done skit. Power never wanted to know. Power was never questioning. Power was pretending to question to keep power feeling like power cares. Power doesn't care. Power never cares. Power can't care. Power will create any system, any method of inquiry to get around having to actually change or care, including figuring out new and different ways of saying power cares. Listen, I don't, this is all very smart. The stuff I'm saying, I'm improvising here, right? Like I don't have the script, I have notes. I'm very proud of myself for this whole power never cares thing. But 
it's only through this album. It's only through what Bo Burnham just showed me with that video. Remember how I talk about how I take myself very seriously and I feel so smart? This Socko thing is it. This is it. Th 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 put this in a time capsule, shoot it into space, and come back in a thousand years, and I'll tell you, this was the situation that we were in. Of course, in a thousand years, we're still gonna be in this situation, probably. Whew. Then we get this skit about a social brand consultant. Perfect music in the background, imitation of what it is, and it's talking about the way that there are such things as woke brands. If you've never watched the video by H Bomber Guy, I believe it's called Woke Brands. I'll put a link in the comment. It is the best description of why there's no such thing as a woke brand. It asks the question, are you willing to use your brand awareness to affect social change and thereby improve your brand awareness? It's not about what you are, it's about what do you stand for. Who are you, Bagel Bites? You will see Bagel Bites there. I bought Bagel Bites for this video. Give me a like and a subscription if you like that fact. Uh, but, you know, like what are you? That is the world that we're in, right? And it actually ties in to the previous song because Bagel Bites and Gillette and all the Skittles with their gray Skittles for pride, all this, it has to pretend that it cares. But who never cares? Power never cares. Tell them that J.P. Morgan is against racism, in theory. A perfectly written joke. This, I'm not a comedian person, right? I don't review comedy. I do listen to a lot of comedy and pay a lot of attention to it. That is a perfect joke. Tell them that J.P. Morgan is against racism, in theory. Just perfect. The next song is White Women's Instagram. I'm not actually a big fan of this one. It's funny. But this general concept has already been done better by Dorian Electra on their song, uh, on their video for um, F the World. I'll include a link to that as well. Jesus, I'm gonna forget to include the links, but hopefully I do. Um, but this is like a funny song, I guess, about white women's Instagram. It has a nice middle part where after making fun of the pumpkin spice lattes and all the general ways that white women are being made fun of, which is really adjacent to a certain form of misogyny, which, I don't really think is funny. Like it's too close. It feels too much. It's kind of like the Karen thing, the Karen meme, where there is a thing to be criticized, but then people grab onto it and then they just use it as an excuse to just pile on women and things that women like. So I actually don't like white women's Instagram at all. Now that I think about it. But there is a little section where you empathize with this mythical white woman who has an Instagram, who misses her mom and is trying to do well. So we at least empathize with her. Then there's a skit in which he just talks about is it necessary to have every single person express every single thought on every single thing that happens always. This is where the first time where I really realized that he's also filling the Louis C.K. hole. That doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound good in like three different ways, but still. You know, Louis C.K. Um, got uh, rightfully criticized and his career has taken a hit. Um, because he did terrible things and he has not um, sufficiently responded to those uh, problems. Um, but he's another one of those comedians. You know, I would say the only comedian kind of on the same level of Bo Burnham in terms of intelligence and humor and honesty. Um, but this whole skit just sounds to me like a good Louis C.K. skit. I don't know. Leads into Unpaid Intern, which is very clearly an imitation. Toby, would you stop scratching yourself? Uh, an imitation of kind of hit the road jack or, um, you know, working in a coal mine, those kinds of songs. And then he does a reaction video to the song and then a reaction to the reacting. And it's a funny gag. It's very funny. It gets deeper and deeper. What I like about it is that each time he reacts to a reaction, he gets deeper into his own self. So first he says the song is funny and then he goes, oh, me reacting to the song is funny. And then, oh, me showing you reacting to the reaction is me trying to think I'm so smart, but actually I'm not. And then after that saying, well, actually me being so self-deprecating, if I criticize myself, then no one else will criticize me for being a douchebag. Like all the things that go on in your head when you're a performer, when you're a content maker, when you think about how to present yourself, when you think about how to do things to either seem likable or to know or to express that you're not likable, all those things. And then he goes, am I balding? And, and then he, he turns it off, which is part of the problem of making damn content is you're worried about balding all the time. And if I don't do my hair right, like today, I did my hair in such a way where you see all that up there, I don't like that. I usually try to have one guy go over that way or two guys over that way, but I didn't. And so literally today, literally, there's an outtake before this video of me going, God damn, my hair looks bad and I'm trying to fix it, okay. Um, 
The next song is called Jeffrey Bezos, which is like a craft worky Devo song. It's just really funny. It's just saying the name Jeffrey Bezos, entrepreneur. Um, it makes us question who do we idolize, who do we love, what does the name Jeffrey Bezos indicate, what does it mean? Then we have my favorite skit of him laying on the floor talking about how it's a bad idea to allow digital media companies to exploit the neurochemical drama of our children for profit. He wrote the perfect sentence, he wrote the perfect joke, maybe that was a bad call. It is just a beautiful, this whole, I mean, talk about, like, like I, while I was watching this, I could not stop laughing. And this is the thing, this whole thing is about like isolation and him not being able to hear. In the off 0% chance of, of him ever getting to watch this video, um, when I watched this whole skit of him lying on the floor talking about social media and the, the brain development of young people, I have never laughed that hard at a comedy special in my entire life. The only other time I think I've ever laughed that hard was probably uh, at Nightman from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> I guess I do like funny musicals. <laughs> um, and then going on to a song about sexting, which is okay. It's kind of like that uh, white woman Instagram song. Like it's funny, but it's just not quite up to the rest of it. Still, it's, it's nice because it is also about the sadness and the distance. In some ways, it's like FaceTiming with my mom because it's sort of talking about the way that, you know, this is what the internet was made for. And just and one of those nice ending hooks that he has, a repeating hook of sitting alone, one hand on my dick, one on my phone. Uh, then a skit where he talks about, you know, thank you for watching my content. And the entire time he's holding on to a knife, which makes you very anxious. That's why I started it. This actually reminds me of the video for Shelia Yeye by Serge Gansborg back there, in which Gansborg sings. And then there's a guy in the back who's doing the twist with a knife. And the whole time, you're just very anxious and not feeling very good. And I think that's something that he's able to do with his live comedy specials, making you uncomfortable, and that's what he does here. Then we have the, uh, the, the song, Look Who's Inside Again. And this seems to be the emotional heart of the album for him. So he's starting to record this. Toby, stop licking your leg. Thank you. Uh, so, so he's like talking about trying to be funny. Okay, don't look that at you, Toby. Just all the licking, please stop. Okay. Um, what I love is he starts this off filming and you see him mess up. And he goes, ah, oh, I took a big effing breath. And he gets really mad and then he hits record again. There are a lot of outtakes to this show where I get really mad at the beginning that it's not working out. Like if you watched me, you'd think I'm a very mean-spirited, angry, hateful person. Because I'm like, damn it, my hair looks bad. But really, it's just that you kind of get in a zone. I love that he included that in here. And the whole song, just, it's kind of like this ditty. And it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Where he's talking about... <sighs> stop, Toby. Do you notice how when I ask him to stop, he stops? So there's just complete silence on the video. He's talking about this alienation that he feels. And what makes it so awesome is he then talks about the fact that when he was a kid he would sit alone in his room and try to avoid going outside. Look who's inside again went outside to find a reason to hide again. We learn later that he has had panic attacks and that's why he hasn't performed in the past couple years and it just becomes this amazing realization that he's talking about quarantine and COVID as potentially being a trigger for childhood trauma. If you had to hide in your room as a child to avoid emotional distress, as many of us have, then being forced to be inside can actually engage with that feeling. And this is a song about that. This goofy little ditty where it's kind of funny and he's sitting on his floor and he's making it, is able to do that. This is another one of these songs that is just like one of the most, Toby, please stop. It's kind of funny, but please stop. Or, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just not going to stop them anymore. Um, you know, the music on here, many of these songs are so good, they could just be real songs. You know, that's my wife, the doctor and missus. Uh, she said, you know, like, I would just want this as an album. And I definitely feel the same way. A song like this, Look Who's Inside Again, the melody is so good. The way, the, the way it's written, the way it's sung, it's just great. Then Accountable, uh, it's okay. It's sort of like a song about being canceled and being held accountable. Not that good. I'm just gonna kind of move on from that. Uh, nice skit of him looking at lighting and trying to figure out how to do it. As the movie goes along, there's more and more apparatus around him. 
Uh, this whole skit about him turning 30, uh, which is kind of neat because I do remember when I realized I was no longer young. And I think for geniuses, uh, getting older is tough because part of what makes it so special is that, you know, Mozart was, what, 22 when he recorded, when he wrote this? When he recorded it. He was 22 in 1974. You know, he's like 22. And so I do think there's a certain pain with that. I will remind you, by though, Proust didn't start writing until he was in his 40s. So you always have time. But, you know, kind of a standard, you know, my granddad was, in, was 27. He fought in Vietnam. When I was 27, I built a birdhouse with my mom. I don't know. It's okay, but it's the ending of the song that has the most interest. My stupid friends are having stupid children. It then transforms this into being a song not just about, it used to be that you were the young boy genius and now you're 30 and now you're no longer young anymore. It's also now that now you're getting too old to be a young father, to be a young family person and this kind of feeling of like other people moving on with their lives. And then he says he's gonna kill himself at 40, um, which definitely don't do. My, the 40s have been the best years of my life. It's not even close. It's been way better being 40 after 10 years of therapy than it was being 25 with none. Uh, key ingredient there is therapy. Uh, but then he has a weird thing where he says about not killing yourself. And then he projects himself talking about not killing himself onto himself looking depressed. And I don't quite get this. I know I don't like it, but I think it's, it's supposed to be a stark and unsettling depiction of the debate about, about why or why not to kill yourself. It feels as though this is the debate that's happening within him. We have the intermission, or as I like to think of it, flip the album over, we get to the song, I Don't Wanna Know, which is about the way artists don't actually wanna know what you feel about their music or about their art because you're too afraid of what they might say. When I was watching this the second time, I was watching it with my wife and she was actually on her phone and there's a part in this where he says, are you on your phone, don't tell me. So she was, but only on the second viewing. Then there's a beautiful sketch about uh, Twitch streaming where he's playing his whole day as a Twitch streamer playing the video game of his day. It's quite funny. It's kind of like a, like a very good Saturday Night Live sketch. The best part is that he plays piano for a second and goes, hmm, that seems to make him feel better. And then he presses the button to cry. And it's a good summary of this moment. We then get to a very quick electro-funk song, Bag of S-H-I-T with just great, weird kind of guitar on there too. Kind of like a party rocking song. This is one of a couple songs that's a party rocking song, but it's about feeling like a big old duffel bag of shit, right? I'm not feeling like I want to get lit. I feel like shit. Just a perfect and funny song. Oh, bye, Toby. Um, and then he talks about, he has a very brief song where he describes having a panic attack. And I think a lot of this album is about having panic attacks and what do they mean? Welcome to the Internet is the big single off of the album. There's a YouTube video of it. It's quite good. It could be a banal commentary on the nature of the Internet, but it just gets to be so much more. It feels like a carnival song that gets spelled up. It's very well sung, millions of ways to engage. Talks about the different things you can see from ways to use a pasta strainer to a nine-year-old who died. It keeps getting faster. It's able to cover in a couple short minutes the nature of incels, the nature of uh, 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 radicalized terrorists on the right, not so much radicalized terrorists on the left, like all this cool kind of catchy stuff until we get to his outro. Apathy is a tragedy and boredom is a crime. Uh, can I interest you in a little bit of everything all of the time? And it's just the perfect explanation of what the internet is. A little bit of everything all the time. It's catchy and it's funny. Then he has a slowdown part where he talks about the way the internet used to be before 9-11. So that's another interesting idea that it used to be, I thought 9-11 didn't make the difference, but just before the 2000s, how nice it was. And then one more little section where mommy let you use her iPad when you were barely two. It did all the things it was designed to do. Now look at you. A fascinating word is the word insidious, where you don't know things are hurting you and you let them into your life and then they hurt you. I've actually... I'm actually writing an academic paper about the history of the word insidious. But all this technology, what it is, is it's insidious. Like it gets in and then you sort of accept it as a nice benign thing. And then before you, it's too late, the whole body's corrupted. And a lot of this work has been about just, oh, he lets you use your iPad and now look at you. It was always the plan to put the world in your hands. He's speaking as power. He's speaking as tech power, but he's speaking as power again. That the best way to control people, it turns out, 
we discovered it, the best way to control people is to give them as much control that doesn't matter as possible. So not control over power, over capital, anything like that, but give them the control to decide what they look at, to decide what they like, to talk about their opinions all of the time. God damn it, I'm still getting more out of this while I'm talking. Because what comes next, the song Jeff Bezos, a Slight Return, and he's able to talk about Jeff Bezos as a representative of these kinds of tech companies who give us this illusion of choice, this illusion of convenience. And one of my favorite lines on the album, you did it. Good job, Jeffrey Bezos, you did it. Then there's a skit where he's basically just just naked. And he just gets more and more naked throughout the entire, uh, the entire movie. I think it's trying to show that he's going savage, his hair is getting longer, his beard's growing longer. We get the song, That Funny Feeling, where he's on a guitar for the first time. And this is another one of these songs that could just be a funny, okay song about technology and phones are bad, LOL but it's not. It's just this beautifully developed thing about the funny feeling that we get and all the things that give us that funny feeling. Things that make us feel like things aren't quite right. Things as seemingly fine as the live action uh, Lion King, right? Just anything like that. Just these things that make us feel like something's a little wrong. And then he, uh, a gift shop, you wanna know, you know, talk Toby? You wanna say hi? You've been making a lot of noise. Ah. You know, like a gift shop at a gun range, a mass shooting at the mall. It's just this beautiful song about the, 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 the distinction, these things that happen in our brains where we just sort of go, huh, something is wrong. That funny feeling. And it's maybe my favorite song on the, on the album. It's so good. It's so funny. A beautiful, another one of those beautiful catchy outros. Hey, what can you say? So it was um, thundering recently. So Toby's been very needy. And his brother... His brother, the dog named Bo, had like, he had a tail accident and he had to go back in for more surgery yesterday. So he now has like a little teeny tiny tail. So I think he feels bad for his brother. Um, there's a skit here where he's like really, 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 really sad. And like he can't get through a sentence without crying. And I kind of wonder like, is this, is this acting or is it not? And is it better if it's acting or if it's worse? I don't know. Then we get to the song, Put Your Hands Up, which is again, another one of the absolute best songs on the album. It's sung with like a lowered voice and weird fake laughter throughout about put your hands up, uh, you know, show me that you're here. Uh, the doctor and Mrs. my wife, she pointed out that um, this whole thing in the songs where he mentions that he was planning on making a comeback to the stage because he did therapy and he's getting over his panic attacks but he decided to come back right as COVID started. So the whole get your hands up, all eyes on me is what he keeps saying. The final stage, if you're trying to overcome panic attacks like this around crowds and around people is to confront crowds and people. So he was getting ready to do that. He was at the absolute point of confronting it and now he can't do it because of COVID. So this line, all eyes on me, and I was like, that's a Tupac reference. And she's like, no, it's actually much deeper than that. So. Thank you, Dr. and Mrs. Um, you know, like, uh, uh, it's really amazing because it's showing this kind of longing and this pain and this desire to get better, and, but the inability to get better, sort of getting better uh, delayed. And it's just so catchy. Just get your hands up and then get your hands down and pray for me. And he's doing this amazing thing where he's, he's projecting the video live behind him while he's filming all the way throughout he's, this performance Part of the, what makes the performance so spectacular is he does all of these lighting effects and all these video effects live while he's playing. So it's not After Effects. And it's just astounding what he's able to do. And it's just another party anthem for a world that is incapable of partying. And it really isn't particularly funny. It, but it's just so moving and such a good song. Um, then there's a little bit more editing and organizing, and then he sings the song, So This Is How It Ends, which he recorded at the beginning and at the end, so you see both his you know, clean-cut face and his long beard. It's the most earnest song, and he actually ties in all the other songs into it, into this one final song. Oh, he's yawning. That means he's comfortable. Uh, and he says, I promise to never go outside. He talks about the role of the audience as well. Like, how about I sit on the couch and watch you next time, <laughs> which is pretty funny. And then some drums come in and it builds really nicely, almost like a 90s like indie pop song. And then he ends up totally naked. And we have the ending sketch of him going outside, realizing, you know, uh, receiving applause and then trying to run right back inside. 
but he can't, he's locked out. And uh, this is, I think, a really great metaphor too of the fact that the end of COVID does not solve things for a lot of people. A lot of people actually are doing better in COVID because there's no expectations that they can go out. There's no expectations that they have to do other stuff, right? They get to spend more time with their kids. They get to spend more time with their dogs and they don't have to spend that much time outside with other people. The end of COVID doesn't really answer any of these problems. And that's the thing that this whole album has shown, that the problem is us. <sighs> so there's my review of the album, of the video, of the movie Inside. Yeah, I got a little upset as you did, I, Toby. Yeah. Maybe we'll go see your brother, see how he's doing. Oh, boy. Okay. Ah. Well, then, for Bo and Toby and Roland Bart and Mozart and uh, all these other people, here's the camera. Up, Toby. You wanna say goodbye?